All right, so for the last talk of this morning, we have Thomas Grimm, who's going to speak about the tameness in arch theory and physics. Thank you very much. Well, thanks a lot. Well, first of all, thanks to the organizers for putting together uh, this uh, very nice uh, workshop and uh, for inviting me here. So I'm a, I'm a physicist, so I will also give some sort of a physics style talk. And, uh, but I will try to make some contact uh, with recent mathematical development and hopefully help a little bit to further make a pitch between the two um, uh, disciplines. Uh, the work is based on, uh, or this talk is based on a couple of papers. Let me just highlight uh, a, a small number here. Uh, one uh, set of papers is very recent, which is this Michael Douglas and my postdoc Lawrence Schlechter. And then I will, because I want to make this contact with mathematics, I will also mention this uh, work uh, with Benjamin Bakker, Christian Schnell, and Jakob uh, Zimmermann, which, uh, which is a, uh, a specific uh, mathematical theorem. Um, let me begin. Let me start with uh, some uh, motivation. Well, my motivation starts in mathematics, and uh, I essentially um, just broadly state uh, the following fact, the fact that there is a much recent activity in mapping out the same parts of mathematics. And in fact, this uh, same geometry, which I will briefly introduce, has now found its way into various parts of mathematics from algebraic geometry, arithmetic geometry, number theory, and so on. So it's a it's a, uh, it's a very active field. And this might come a little bit as a surprise because, because originally this concept of tameness, which I will introduce, actually comes from mathematical logic and more precisely from uh, model theory. And it essentially, uh, just to kind of get a rough understanding for this introductory part, is essentially states that when you do geometry or when we uh, ask certain questions, you can draw your sets and your functions, which you want to use to describe the system. You can just draw it from a very specific uh, structure. And these structures are called ominum. And I will motivate a little bit why these have been introduced in logic later on. Now, uh, that this has found its way, this kind of uh, uh, geometry or these ominimal structures uh, is indicated here, uh, here that it has found its way into Hodge theory. This happened rather recently, and I give you a, a rather biased and incomplete list of papers, which I know reasonably well. And what uh, this entails to is, for example, it was shown that the, the period map or the period integrals, they're actually drawn from such a specific uh, set, namely from such a specific moment. Then there are a multiple axonal type conjectures for Hodge structures. They are quite a deeper uh, statements and maybe the kind of the most involved statement is kind of this last year's proof of the uh, geometric Andre Rosen period. What I will talk about is actually how this uh, all minimal structures of chain geometry, how they are used in establishing a finiteness result for a uh, self rule integral class. Now, why, 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 why how did I, how did I get into this uh, into this field? Actually, it's one of these exciting things which was mentioned before that there is a, a story which came out of physics, which uh, which turned into a concrete mathematical result. Namely, um, it arose from a physics conjecture. So in, in in physics, we have the problem in the string theory setting to solve a certain problem, which you might call the force problems, and this is solved as Arthur uh, described by, by fluxes. These fluxes are something like generalized electromagnetic fields in, in some compact spaces, 
but from a mathematical point of view, they are nothing else than integral classes in on your on your mind. And the settings which people considered for quite some time is the following: they considered a twelve-dimensional background in a theory called F theory, but that's not important. And the twelve-dimensional background consisted of a Calabial fourfold, so a, a real eight-dimensional space. So it has a a very non-trivial middle cohomology and a four-dimensional space, which is supposed to be our universe. And then in order to solve this problem, one introduces this integral class and this integral class has to satisfy a constraint, namely that its wedge product with itself has to be an integer. And in fact, this integer cannot be too large. They have specific constraints, but they, it has to be some fixed. Now, if you solve the equations of motion, the physical equations, then this cannot just be any integral class, but it has to be uh, what you might want to call a self-dual integral class. Namely, it, under the Hodge star operation, it has to map to itself. Now, of course, this is, gives a constraint on what is the complex structure of the space in order that such a condition is that. Now, what is the conjecture which led to the theorem? Namely, in almost 20 years ago now, it was uh, suggested that the, this, uh, the number of solutions to string theory, not necessarily only to this setting, is it's a certain bound on the vacuum energy, KK scale, compactification volume. All of these things are not uh, important in the following, but the statement was that this is finite. There should be just finitely many solutions. So now if we apply this to the setting, then it means that we should have finitely many solutions to these equations. And this is a very, very hard uh, problem. And so now let's turn this into a mathematics problem. So it's a very hard problem, but it's sufficiently concrete that you can translate it into Hodge. Now let's formulate the same problem in Hodge here. Now let's consider M to be a smooth complex algebraic variety. And you can think about this as the moduli space of, a, of this Calabi-Yau manifold, calabi for example, but the sphere will be general. Right? It doesn't have to be calabi -Yau in the sphere. And um, now, in order to smooth it, you might have to resolve some singularities, but this is the well-known theorem that you can always. Now, let's consider the Hodge bundle over uh, this, this space, right, over this moduli space. And your Hodge bundle will be just some uh, abstract PQ uh, splitting, right, which follows a variation of Hodge. Bundles. So the, the fibers of this bundle actually split like this, and I will uh, uh, look at even weight um, uh, Hodge structures. Your Hodge structures. Then I have to tell you what is the analog of this uh, this Hodge star operator. Well, in, in Hodge theory, that is the so-called vial operator. And the vial operator just acts on the elements of the PQ by uh, the following action, namely I to the P minus. If you want, that's the definition of the vial operator on, on such a Hodge filtration and uh, or a Hodge splitting. And in, in, in geometric forms, this really turns into the Hodge star in the model. Hmm? Okay. I think it's the right one. Ah, you mean the pronunciation? Or... Ah, oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. I'm... I, I pronounce them as a German uh, Anyway, uh, should not stop there. So the, uh, furthermore, um, the polarization, we introduce a polarization on this, uh, on this hot structure and this hot polarization is just uh, some inner product, which for example, if in, in a geometric setting, you can just think of it as the wedge between two forms. Yeah, it, that's how we would see it from geometry. And now what is the theorem? 
The theorem states that for any integer L bigger than zero, the locus of self to integral classes, namely of all the classes on, uh, of all the elements X, V of the Hodge bundle, which satisfy the following conditions. First of all, the V is quantized. So that's what uh, Arthur would call, a, or physicists would call a flux. So it's really an integral class. And this integral class actually satisfies the self-duality relation under the, 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 the well-known Dale operator. And uh, furthermore, you, if you impose the condition that Q, so the, the product of the, this uh, integral class with itself is actually equal to L, then the resulting set of solutions to this, like this space SL, actually is uh, a set from this, from one of these, that you pick out of one of these omnium of structures, namely the set. Now, why is this interesting? It essentially states from general theorems that S has only finitely many connected components and therefore it proves exactly this conjecture, which was a, a, a ground for, for 20 years. Now, uh, this is quite exciting. I will come back to it uh, a little bit later, but uh, after, after working together with these uh, uh, mathematicians, and of, of course, I would have never been able to, to prove such a thing without these uh, brilliant math collaborators. Yeah. You said that it proved that conjecture, but you mean it proves that the finiteness of these classes, but not of the whole no, no, it proves this, yeah. It proves this conjecture in the specific setting if you fix the topology. If you assume that it's, uh, that you have finitely many compact Calabial forces, it really proves the conjecture in the whole setting. But uh, otherwise, it just proves it in this. Yes, in order to prove kind of the more general. But also note that the theorem is much more general. It doesn't even have to come from geometry. It can be some abstract variation of Hopf structure. It, can, it doesn't have to be Calabria or fold. Calabria condition plate overall. But sorry, yes, maybe a two part question. But which? So in these conjectures of Douglas and company, they have these conditions you mentioned, KK scale and so on. They There's are no set type. They, said they are satisfied automatically in so, this setting. So there is no condition like this. This no. theorem does not. No, no, no. This is the. That's that's so, what we discussed before. So the hard part is to take these physical conjectures, apply it to some setting where you can get rid of the physical conditions where they are automatically satisfied in some sense, and then prove it generally. And and what about the uniformity in let's say some kind of uh, moduli or something like that? Yeah, I will come back. Okay. Uh, yes, still in the beginning. So. So how do you see the conditions are satisfied in your yeah. uh, You know that when you have the self to a vacuum, that the vacuum energy is actually zero. So the bound on the vacuum, these are really solutions which have zero vacuum energy. So the bound is satisfied. And exactly, these are actually, actually, actually zero solutions. So that fits uh, fits home. Yeah. Anyway, so the so this is how I entered the field of ten geometry, which was absolutely crucial, as I will point out in this uh, in, in in a few words later on. And uh, it turns out that it's such a nice story, which actually goes beyond, so to say, what what physicists have used so far. And so I I did through my knowledge about uh, theories coming from string theory. And what I noticed is actually that this sort of tameness property seems to be everywhere in these effective theories. And so what, uh, what I suggested essentially is to, to think about this in the following way, that uh, in fact, that this tameness is a property of effective theories which come out of string theory. Now this theorem essentially is an evidence for that, because I told you that the set of solutions is a tame set, so it, it's part of the special structure. And in fact, we know from physics that 
around each of these solutions, there is an effective theory, and then it would be a tank theory. So it's very strong evidence, but this statement is much, much uh, broader. And of course, there is a lot to be checked to see if it's Now, it got even more exciting when we realized that it's not just in string theory omnipresent, actually in quantum field theory and just in general quantum systems, uh, for example, when you talk about Feynman amplitudes, uh, then uh, it is actually, uh, they also turn out to be tank functions. So, you, so there is quite a, uh, quite a set of objects in physics which are satisfying these, uh, these criteria. Okay, now having uh, kind of given you some motivation where the excitement uh, came from, now I should tell you more precisely what this is, this tank, tank geometry or tameness. Well, it's this theory of all minimal structure. It is a general, it's generalized finiteness principle. And if you want, you could say it's sort of a, finiteness of geometric complexity. As a, there is a nice introductory book uh, by Fundenzies, and uh, there have been quite a, uh, some activity in, in recent years. So I mentioned here the Fields Institute program, and during my last visit was mentioned, there will be actually a whole program uh, about uh, all minimal, um, all minimal. Now, what does it do, this principle? It avoids wild functions and, uh, and sets, as the name suggests. So there are no sets with infinitely many disconnected components. So the integers and the lattices are out. If you do tan geometry, you're not allowed to talk about the integers. So it's, a, it's, a, it's a constraint, yeah, quite a strong constraint. And uh, there are no complicated functions. Well. A complicated fine, but they are not allowed to be too wild. For example, this function here, which is like infinitely many different times differentiable, but it has like this infinitely many accumulation points of zeros near the center. This is not a tame function. And why? Because you could use the sign to define the integers by looking at the zero. Now, the interesting part, as I already mentioned, is the motivation came from logic, and it, there it actually came from trying to avoid difficult question about undecidability, like Gödel's theorem of undecidability. This, uh, as you probably all know, is about the integers. So if you kind of get rid of the integers, then, uh, then you have better chance to be decidable. But you want to focus on another part of property rather than the undecidable. Now, why is it maybe most interesting to this uh, workshop is the following. It actually realizes the Groton Peak's dream of having a mathematical framework for geometry. So kind of there was the idea that the topology used in mathematics uh, is designed by mathematicians doing analysis and it's much too wild and one should uh, restrict it. In fact, he proposed this sort of a tame topology and exactly this is what, what came out of these all minimal structures and logic. So now what is the definition of such an uh, such a minimal structure? It actually collects subsets of Rn. So it's something really, really basic. For each n, it collects subsets of Rn, which are closed under finite unions, finite intersections, complements, and products. Okay? And these all correspond to, uh, uh, to logical symbols. That would be or and end and so and it has to be closed under projection. So I, if I give you a higher dimensional set and you project it down, it should still be part of this uh, collection of subsets. Yeah? Linear projections should be allowed. In logic, this would be the existential quantifier. So there exists an X with the following. Now, in order to make it richer than algebraic geometry, you already include the real polynomials in these sets. So of course, otherwise the zero set satisfies all of these conditions, but, uh, but now you include also the real polynomials, it's already a rich class of sets and functions. Now, what is now this O minimality property, this tameness property is actually remarkably simple. It's essentially, it's, it's just a statement that the only allowed subsets of the real line are finite unions of points and intervals. These intervals can be infinitely long, but only finite units. 
So it, the integers would be an infinite union of points. Yeah? So it's not part of the story. So that tames the structure. And this is kind of was introduced as a very powerful property uh, by Fannenfries, who incidentally is uh, an Utrecht uh, alumni. We have a nice comment. In any case, uh, the sets in the O minimal structure S are then called the tame sets. Functions in, of, are called tame function if their graph is a tame set. And then you can define tame manifolds, tame bundles, and ho a whole tame geometry. And the point is that actually most of the things which geometers have done over the years can already be defined in this because you never actually allowed these wild things to happen. The, the tricky part is there are many uh, known O minimal structures, but it, they are very difficult to construct. Essentially, it's a statement, which functions do you allow such that they don't break these, uh, these axioms? So the simplest one are just the algebraic sets, semi-algebraic sets. You just take the zeros of real polynomials and you put them into the structure then if you complete it with these projections and so on with these axioms, you get inequalities into this, uh, into this statement. And these are called the semi-algebraic sets and they form such an open. Okay, so this is kind of the most basic thing. It's a non-trivial theorem that is working that you really get this uh, semi-algebraic set, but it gets non-trivial once you as, want to add more functions to the set, uh, for, to the structure. So what happens if I take polynomials and add new functions f to generate the sets? So which functions am I allowed to use? Can I just use an arbitrarily complicated function or do they violate these actions? And that's very, very complicated. And in fact, the logical perspective is the following. So it means essentially that you formulate a statement about your setting using your, your, your standard symbols yeah, in your ring over your ring over R and then your function set of functions. And then you can formulate any sort of uh, logical state. So why, why is it uh, that there is a lot of excitement? Because it's very non-trivial to, 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 to add this function. And in particular, it was a, a considered a big breakthrough to show that the exponential function, the real exponential function is such a tame function. Now, the usual question when I uh, give the talk is like, well, look at the exponential, it looks extremely tame, right? It looks as if, how could it be that there is a non-trivial theorem there? But it actually took very long to, to prove this and they challenging. And the fact is that you have to not only just stare at the function that it looks very tame, you actually look at, have to look at every higher dimensional set generated by this function and make sure that you never, by any projection or intersection, violate these actions. And that can be very challenging. No, no. It can be an infinite set, but it has to be connected. So in the real line, an infinite integral is fine. And of course, the exponential is in a two-dimensional set. So, so, so that that was a, a, a big break to the to the field, and from then on, kind of it took up uh, some steam, and now it kind of goes into all the fields of mathematics. So now, uh, the other interesting part is that you can add restricted analytic function, take an analytic function, restrict it to a smaller interval, and you can show it still is uh, can define a, an O-minimal structure. In fact, you can also combine both. Namely, you can combine the restricted analytic function and the exponential function. And if you add all of these functions together, it's still an O minimal structure. And that's exactly the O minimal structure, which appeared in the theorem, which I mentioned in the very beginning. Now, there are much more fancy construction like a Puffian extension, where you can in include solutions to first order differential equations. So tameness goes well with first order differential equations. Unfortunately, not so well with second order differential equation in physics, many of the equations are second order. So, but special ones you can handle. 
No, just to point out that this is something which is still ongoing. Only last year, it was shown that there exists an O-minimum structure where the gamma function uh, and the zeta function are defined. So that's a, so it's by no means something which has ended in the 90s, but it's still uh, an active field done by, by, by logicians. So just to give you a feeling, so that's how an, a tame function look like. If every tame function from the real line to the real line, you can always partition the domain into finitely many intervals. And on each interval, the function will be monotonic and continue. And so in particular, any such function can have only finitely many minima and maxima, right? if you can differentiate, and it has to have a tail tame to infinity. So there will always be a last interval where the function gets boring because it cannot wiggle around it. Like for the exponential function, it's not weird that periodic functions are out. And that's kind of the remarkable thing that the sine function on the real uh, line is not a tame function. As I mentioned before, you could also use it to define it. Now, why is this all exciting? It's exciting because the things which appear in Hodge theory are actually tame functions. So the tameness of the period map was uh, shown in this 2018 paper. And it's essentially, it proceeds in a couple of steps. The first thing which you show is that the veil, uh, veil operator is actually uh, 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 definable. So it's a tame function in this RNX. So why do you need the X? So like maybe uh, just to point this out. The, the point is that you know that this is not an algebraic function. Right, because we solve the bigger books equation, it has infinitely many exponential corrections. So you need the exponential to define the function. So it cannot just be some 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 purely analytic thing which is restricted. So you need the exponential. So uh, and it has to be analytic because we know that uh, on a small disk near the uh, any point there is a whole analytic expansion of the period. And the, for the vial operator, you can show that using uh, the Newton's orbit theorem. That's the, that's the key part here. And essentially, you see it as an, a map from your uh, base space, from your moduli space, into um, um, the orthogonal group of your pairing, yeah, of the wedge product, divided by the orthogonal group of the pairing evaluated for some fixed uh, vial operator. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's why it's a difficult theorem. First order matrix equation, but certain matrix equations. Certain matrices have to have. Well, the, the point is that once you want to show this, you're not showing it using a uh, pick up books equation. So this is really an independent theorem which you show using asymptotic Hodge theory. It really, of course, these two things are equivalent via Gauss-Mannin and so on, but you don't show it. Uh, or you don't show it using uh, the differential equation. So the, in other words, there are special differential equations appearing in Hodge theory, and they are still preserving same. <laughs> Yeah, but complex exponentials are not so good. Because complex yeah. exponential design, uh, design. So that's the non trivial part. Yeah. Very nice. Did you show that something is saying on the period map? I, I, like I, will, I will show you. Yeah. You need C. No, this is this is C. It's the bottom of the I'm just like, I'm not, 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 I
No. Yeah, I, I interpret it as uh, an, all this, this set of all Hodge operators are elements of the group G, which is the orthogonal group of the pair. Okay, so now, so, so now the, the well operator period map is taking the well operator and actually modding out the orthogonal group of this, uh, of this, of this infinite lab, yeah, of this pairing on the flag. Okay. And now proving that this is the same function is much more difficult. It actually uses the SS2 over theorem. And that's the, so to say, one of the non-trivial steps in the in the bucket linear phenomenon. And once you have this, you can lift the statement that the period map itself, so not the veil operator, but the period map itself is definable in the RNA. So in contrast to looking at the differential equation, this tameless statement comes really from, from the Hodge theory statement, uh, from the Hodge theory uh, analysis. So it's proof. Uh, abstract. Now, let me remind you of a very famous theory which, rem uh, which relates to a talk which was uh, mentioned yesterday by Katani, Delin, and uh, Kaplan from 95. It actually states that if you have the integer L bigger than zero, that the locus of integral Hodge classes, namely classes which are of type PD, and they are in uh, integral, yeah, and they have this condition. So this tetral condition or this constraint from physics this is already in this paper from 95. If you take this into account, then actually the locus of these equations where these equations are satisfied is algebraic. So this is really a remarkable theorem because as we just discussed, the periods are horribly complicated, but as soon as you restrict the periods to be of type T, DD, I'll specify in DD forms, Actually, this locus can be described by a polynomial equation and all these exponential corrections, they actually cancel. And that's a very, very non-trivial statement. It seems, it indicates that something very special happens. And of course, the very special thing which happens is related uh, to, to the Hodge index. No, uh, yeah. no. But, they, but things are going this way, actually. I, we can discuss after. Okay. So why is this a very famous theorem? It also follows from the Hodge conjecture. So you can also assume the Hodge conjecture for a projective uh, uh, Kähler manifold, and then use this assumption to prove the same theorem. So it's sort of a very strong evidence that the Hodge conjecture is true. And it's very general, so it's not example-based, so it's uh, that's why it's considered one of the strongest. And in fact, it covers this finiteness of the special case where this G4, now in physics language, for Calabria fourfold, where the G4 is actually of type T2. So if the G4 is of type T2, it's actually even more constraining, namely that the locus is algebraic, and that's what we also uh, probably would hope from this. So the, the original proof of uses Hodge theory, and the Nilford and orbit theorem. But what is the nice reason thing is that there is an alternative proof that uses tameness of the period. And remarkably, this tameness, this proof using tameness is just a few lines long. Of course, you have to use hard theorems from and geometry, but essentially the sta statement is if you have a complex analytic function, which the periods are known to be, which is also tame, then it has to be algebra. So it's, it, it just follows from this general uh, uh, O-minimal chart theory. So for Calabria fourfold, that uh, means that if I satisfy this equation, which uh, Arthur also uh, displayed in, in, in slightly different form. So if I have this function here, then this statement here is just that it is of type two, two. And if there are more equations uh, it, it, there are more equations than unknowns. Yeah? So it's an, it's an unlikely intersection theory and these uh, strong statements. 
Now, the, remarkable, uh, the important point to notice is that the relies on holomorphicity. But in physical situation, holomorphicity is most of the time absent. And in fact, in this more general theorem, it is absent. So actually, tameness seems to be a property which is preserved away from the holomorphic world. Yeah. So that's uh, also, um, yeah, what some physicists like to point out. Well, we can compute holomorphic things. Well, now we have a property which allows us to go beyond the holomorphic uh, world. And in fact, in this uh, in this uh, theorem, when you look at the self-dual forms, actually you have not considering only uh, uh, a complex locus, but it's actually a real locus and we are in the real world. We first used, tried to use asymptotic Hodge theory to show it and it's turned out to be notoriously difficult to import. So only for one parameters is possible, but for multi parameters. So I give you here the details of the proof, but I have not time to go through. So it's really a clever use of tameness of the period map together with the fact that uh, these lattices reduce into finitely many orbits if you impose uh, this step testing. So now a question to the mathematician. So what is the analog of the Hodge conjecture in this case? So what are the cycles associated to the self dual class? So that would be very interesting for holography because in holography we often replace uh, like flux by cycles and then we have some sort of brain configuration. And this is an open question. So it's very, and maybe one of you has a good guess for this. So what is the analog of the, ana, uh, the algebraic cycle which you have here in the, in the Hodge conjecture? What is the analog here for the self -tool? And there should be something. Anyway, I wanted to quickly mention the Tetpool conjecture, but I want to be brief on this. So a new conjecture, which is very concrete, is this Tetpool conjecture. So I told you that in all of these theorems, there is this constraint on the self intersection of this integral class. And in fact, this arises from consistent coupling to gravity. So if you have a non compact space, you don't have to impose. And now the Tetpool conjecture in the weakest form essentially says that if I fix such a self, uh, such a, a self intersection L, and I make the dimension of my space uh, larger than this L, actually the dimension of the Hodge locus should be bigger than zero. So that's a very weak, of, a, a very weak statement of the Tetpool. And this comes from examples and so on. And it's a, uh, it's, 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 it's a remarkable statement and it could be in principle proved using, you could imagine that there is a proof using these techniques, but it's much harder than this finite mistake because it's very important to, so you, it's not enough to use asymptotic watch theory for this. You really need motivic information. You need something about the quantized structure. But uh, certainly it's, a, it's an interesting thing. To consider so why do we believe that this is uh, not completely absurd? We we actually proved in an all asymptotic regimes using asymptotic Hodge theory. At least if your periods are given by SL two orbits, you can see that this theory, this statement is very very reasonable. Yeah? Essentially because everything splits up into blocks, and if you want to reduce the dimension of the Hodge locus, you have to have an integral class in this block for some rationale. Yes. The constraint. The right. That's the which condition? This condition here? Ah, I just pick pick an L. Just pick it. There's no condition. I just no no no. There's no condition. It just comes out. This is not a condition. The condition comes that it's an asymptotic statement that the dimension of this of this uh, of the base of the moduli space has to be sufficiently large compared to the the number which comes out. So this is the non-trivial condition. 
physics problem, the other depends on the yeah, but you can just fix the picket. No, no, it's not a tassel. It's just given by the self intersection. No, you 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 pick up. I think it's all it's all fine. So you pick up you pick a flux and you compute the number which comes out. Uh, or you you just you pick a number L and then you look at your manifold and you want to be sure that all the fluxes which you consider satisfy this condition for a given L. Yeah. Yeah. No, 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 this is not L. This is L. It's by definition L. That's just a definition of L. <laughs> ah, you, you're disturbed by the word condition here. Yeah, that you have to fix an L. Right, but I, you don't need to. You just pick an L, and then you consider all the satisfy this condition, and then when you are a string theorist, you know that certain Ls are particularly nice. In any case, uh, so that's the st that's the mathematical statement, uh, the weakest mathematical statement which you can make, and uh, I believe, and then you could try to prove this, and I. I I'm optimistic that at least for the Hodge locus, using this theory of unlikely intersections, probably you are able to prove it eventually, if it is true. Yeah. Ah, so it, because I wanted to make the weakest statement there, I believe it's true. So what I don't know, so what I, be, okay, I don't know, but I believe that this number here depends on the Hodge structure on the, on the manifold to consider. So roughly you have an estimate of this number here, what is kind of the biggest SL2 representation which you have in the asymptote in the limit of the And for Calabiao four folds, they are very small. That's why these numbers are very small. But if I have a Calabiao 1000, then these numbers will be much bigger I think, because it will be related to the representation theory of Right. I know that there are many uh, non-trivial uh, discussions about this in the, in the math literature, but this question has not about those. Yeah, I don't think I, we can discuss this after. I don't think that there is. Yeah, I think these maps are so nice that this has a well-defined dimension here. There's so much known about the Hodge locus that it has a well-defined dimension. But we can just have that. I agree. Yeah, yeah. So that, that's exactly the challenge. The challenge is to take the positive physics literature and translate it into something mathematical with the positive physics. So my second question is, can one of you please prove this conjecture for the Hodge locus or for the self-dual locus. So I think Arthur would say for the self-dual locus, it's certainly not true. It's a feeling, but I agree that it's much more challenging. Okay, so I'm already over time, right? So I got, yeah. Okay, so maybe, maybe it's quite, 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 quite. So now, now let me turn to uh, quantum field theories. And essentially in quantum field theories, we look at a very different physical question and you will see in a moment how this is related to what I just discussed. Namely, we consider scattering amplitude. Of course, these are real functions. They are very complicated functions which appear in, 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 in a physical setting and they give you some probability of how particles scatter. Okay. They are in physics defined over all possible processes and so on. It's horribly complicated. But in any case, uh, clever physicists have developed this expansion into Feynman, uh, Feynman integrals. And 
the nice thing about this is that these Feynman integrals, each one of them is an, a proper integral which we can compute. They are very complicated integrals. Yeah, 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 sure, 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 yeah. Sure, 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 yeah, yeah, always yeah. happen. No, I don't worry. I, I will come back to this. Okay, so what is the theorem which we now uh, proved? Now, there is, a, there is a hot star here. Why? Because that's a physics theorem. Yeah? There's a difference between the mathematics theorem, which is true, and the physics theorem, which is true if you, if you, yeah, don't open your eyes to wipe it. So, but, <laughs> so, so they, there are good arguments that this is true. So what is for any renormalizable quantum field theory with finitely many particles and intersection is finite. All finite loop amplitudes, so that's, that's about the asymptotic series, I cut at finite loop, are tame functions of the masses external momenta on the couple. And so essentially, whenever you compute one of these complicated integrals, it actually is a tame function. So there is some hidden finiteness property in all perturbative quantum field theory amplitudes. And it's a very non-trivial theorem because it essentially states that uh, there is a non-trivial uh, uh, or can be non-trivial uh, interrelations between algebraic relations between Feynman, uh, Feynman amplitudes and symmetries of, of the system. Okay. Now, how does it, where does it come from? I don't have a, a lot of time. Essentially, I just state the basic punchline, it's essentially coming from the idea that uh, Feynman integrals can be written as very generally as relative periods of some associated geometry. Uh, many here in the audience have worked on this, so I, there will be talks in the later part of the, of the, of the workshop. And uh, the remarkable fact that they have been proved to be tame functions also now translate into the fact that all the Feynman amplitudes are tame. Okay. Now we can come to uh, uh, Albrecht's question. So we know this is just an asymptotic series. We know that uh, if I sum them all up, I get infinite, I get an infinity. This is not an analytic expansion, but it's some trans series expansion. So what about tameness in a non perturbative quantum field theory? So in non perturbative quantum field theory, you actually are interested in computing uh, correlation functions with a complete action, like with a complete uh, path integral. And this is very, very complicated, but what I want to do is I want to just say some physicists compute this for me, and it's a very complicated function. There goes a lot of in ingenuity in computing it, but I want to look at the final result as a function of the parameters, for example, of the masses, and on the, of the positions on space-time, and want to ask the question, is this a tame function? Okay. Now let's look at the simple example and then we will come to our next question. The simple example is when you do that in zero dimensions and you look at phi to the four theory, then you can compute it. And actually what you find is a Bessel function. And the Bessel function is not a theory. So in fact, is this tame? Well, it, uh, it does not have an analytic expansion around decoupling. So it's precisely this feature which was mentioned. It's just a trans series expansion has resurgence phenomena and so on. So it's definitely not in R and X. However, the remarkable thing is there is a other O minimal structure, a bigger O minimal structure, which accommodates all these functions or, or many of these functions which have these resurgence phenomena. And these are so-called Fafian structures. And you can show actually that this is part of the structure structure. And this is uh, ra rather remarkable because only last year, o, o minimality has been sharpened and there has been some sort of new notion of O minimality there, which also captures some sort of complexity, the degree of the phenomena, which was asked before, which is really encoded in the structure itself. And this non-perturbative amplitude is actually part of the structure. And we are now going to uh, bring this into physics, actually. Now, there are multiple challenges in mathematics. Let me skip this. The question I have to you is, 
what about exponential periods? What is the developed theory? Is there a developed theory of exponential periods? Because exponential periods are the thing which you need. I see a mathematician smiling here. I don't know if it's good or bad. So uh, is there a developed theory of uh, exponential periods, which can be uh, used to show that exponential periods are definable in this Pachian homonymous function? And with this, uh, I want to end because I'm running over time. Uh, what is the, so to say, the, the idea now of this whole program is we want to actually map out the tame parts of physics. Okay? And we made this very concrete, concrete and it had led to multiple new conjectures, which I have no doubt will eventually have some impact on mathematics. Yeah. We, we essentially stated our precise ideas about conformal field theories, which part of conformal field theory should be tamed. And as I mentioned already before, we stated more or less precisely because here the objects are not as well defined as in conformal field theory, what we expect from effective theories coming out of quantum gravity. And with this, I'd like to thank you very much. So perhaps, okay. Well, I was just wondering, and you would mention you're saying that that tameness works, you get something that is a best of function that gets tamed. Yeah. Uh, does that, is that so true if you do matrix models? I don't know. So, that, so, uh, so, so this has just kind, kind of completely, it's completely, exactly, that's what you should know. So it has entered physics only recently, right? Through, through these efforts and there are, now you can look at all sorts of interesting questions. For example, a very interesting question, which I also can pose to you is, is the uh, topological string partition function, which we now understand to better extend also non perturbative is this a tame function? At each loop order, you can ask, is, are these tame functions, are matrix model tame functions? We are now looking at conformal field series in two dimensions, Vesselina Witten models and ask, are our conjectures about conformal field theories in two dimensions true? And are all the correlation functions same function? So now you have this huge bulk of physics literature which produces non trivial functions. And you can ask if they are part of this tame of the tame physics. Once it's part of the tame physics, you can use this strong theorem from math theorems from mathematics to show very general properties about algebraic uh, relations among amplitude and so on. So that's, that's my, my vision for the future. Uh, two comments. Um, one is that uh, exponential periods have a fairly well-developed framework. I mean, as you know, GKZ periods in general are exponential periods and the ones that are periods of variations in odd structure are just some resonant case. Right. Um, but the there's been an exponential Hodge theory developed by various people that goes back to the work of Sabah and followed earlier. And uh, Peter Yosin and Javier Prezon had the monograph on the subject. So probably talk to them as a I, I talk, yeah. Um, the second thing would be that I don't see a reason off the top of my head for why integer classes in H40 plus H22 plus H04 should have any cycle interpretation any more than rank on attractor points should have a cycle theoretic interpretation for Calabria three points, right? But that doesn't make them not special in some way minimal sense, like suitable for the math or something that take moments, right? So, I mean, specialness in the Hodge theory sense is a rather narrow notion. Yeah. No, yeah. It would be nice to have a definite answer to this. So your feeling is that there is no. Right. Yeah, no but it would be nice to have a. I, I think so. In the light of these holography papers, which attack the scenario, which, uh, which Arthur presented this KKL2 scenario, which is very, very popular, very big story around it, it would be. There is some suggestion of some sort of dual interpretation of these cycles, but I don't know if this is by any means complete. So I, I don't think that 
in any case, it would be nice to ex exclude, then it, it would be nice to exclude that there is such an I, I only want to make a silly physicist comment. So uh, if the universe is compact or the sitter, which is more likely, then the entropy is finite, so everything is tame. So tameness is really deep at the heart of physics. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Even more silly physicist question. So what is concretely now, say, a condition on, on a consistent theory to be coming to quantum gravity? Just before you say it's just it's a property of ordinary quantum field theories without gravity. Right. Now here you have this picture with quantum gravity. So what goes wrong if you sort of would happen to find a theory which is non tame in a way, like very nasty speaking, yeah. a classical dynamic system which is a chaotic, a fractal behavior is very awful. So uh, what, what was, goes wrong if you try to couple things like this to quantum gravity? Yeah, so, 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 uh, so I, I gave here a few examples of systems which, uh, which are not, uh, which are not tame, and we also do not expect to be coupled to grand and gravity. So one one example is uh, something like you have a scalar potential, which forces you on onto an infinite spiral in, in its vacuum. Right? So this goes against many of the conjectures we have about the nature of quantum gravity, form language, and in particular, the distance conjecture would be severely challenged. So I give you some compact region in space. And of course, in any compact region of space, I can draw an infinite spiral. And if such an infinite spiral comes from a scalar potential from string theory, I would violate the distance projection. If I lower the energy, I'm in this infinite spiral and uh, it's just ordinary region in space. So, so, but this is not a tame, that's not a tame function. Mm -hmm. But this, this is of course a very, on a very abstract, Elevated right. level, you know, and, 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 and actually people try to construct models of this type and they never yeah. But what I mean, for example, they typically swamp plant conditions boil down to decay properties of black holes, you know, typically it's always the same story that uh, some kind of entropy bounds or whatever, some, some things are violated. Yes. So, so what is a concrete play, say, for such an example, you know, where would go, uh, quantum gravity go wrong? There would be a contradiction of- Well, say, I mean, yeah, this is unfortunately an example where the distance conjecture is also equally badly motivated by right. like whole physics. So there, it's another good example to, uh, to make, make my point. But I have another example here. For example, functions which have discrete infinite order symmetries, mm -hmm. they can also never be taken, mm -hmm. right? Because the sine function has an infinite mm -hmm. order symmetry, just to have infinitely many uh, minima if you want. And, and, and this symmetry is believed to be absent in the theory of quantum gravity. We have like whole argument for it. And so it ties in nicely with, with this conjecture. Of course, it, it doesn't follow from any of these conjectures. It's really a new principle. I just, uh, yes, sorry, another point occurred to me. So what about the famous series of ADS5 and S5 vacuum with any flux, flux going to infinity? How do you rule, how do you exclude that ah, from so, the considerations? So, so, well, I didn't, this is not part of this talk. So they, you have to put a cutoff at the ESP. Okay. I mean, I, I understand that this is logical, but this seems to be a very by hand physicist thing to do to put a cutoff. Well, I mean, there seems to be, as a, as, a, as a theory, there seems to be a perfectly well-defined set of these series connected by domain walls, which are not tame. We don't form a tame set. We can talk about this in the frame. Oh, all right, so we thank the speaker again. And I'll see you at lunch. <laughs> <laughs>